Hey, this is Marty Coleman from SeldomUseReserve.com and Mom's Basement. In just a minute, I'll be joined by Brandon Rink of OrangeAndWhite.com and we'll continue with our preseason preview, this time looking at the defense and special teams. But please take a moment to listen to the message coming up next. And hang in there. We'll be talking Tiger football in just 30 seconds. I wanted to take a brief second to talk about the artwork on SeldomUseReserve.com and the artwork for this podcast. Both were done by Clemson graduate Adam Ergel at no cost to the site. Over the years, Adam's done a bunch of work for the site and has done it all just because of his love of Clemson and the Clemson Tigers. If you find yourself in need of any graphic artist services, you may want to reach out to Adam. You can contact Adam at adam.ergel at gmail.com or at adamergel.com. That is A-D-A-M-E-A-R-G-L-E. Thanks. Okay, Brandon, we're going to move on to the defensive side for this episode, and let's uh, let's talk about the defensive line. Uh, somewhat similar to the offensive line is that when you look at it on paper, sitting here late July, early August, it sounds good. You've got Corey Crawford uh, at one defensive end, Vic Beasley at the other, backed by Barnes and Lawson, respectively. But once again, that suspension bugaboo hits, and Crawford will be out for the Georgia game, which has me thinking the defensive end spot, at least for the first game, and and we would have focused on the whole season here, but with Georgia looming in front of us, it looks a little thin for that first game. Who, in your estimation, uh, is going to back up uh, Barnes in that first game? Will they move Lawson back and forth, or how are they going to handle that? That, that would make a lot of sense. You, you want to get lost in that, on the field as much as you can just because he's a, I mean, a special talent. You know, Tavares Barnes, he, uh, he's like he said, guy that's on the verge of a breakout. I mean, he's, he's saying the right things in spring. You know, he wants to – and this is a you know, money year for him. You know, he's got to you know, step up and get on that NFL radar. And you know, he looks apart physically. The coaches have said that he's really had that focus. So he's going to have his chance right out of the gates, not, not having to split time with Crawford. And he's already listed as sort of the 1A starter to Crawford on the depth chart. So that shows you kind of how much he's progressed. But, you know, beyond uh, Lawson, you've got a freshman and a uh, redshirt freshman and uh, Ebenezer Ogundeku. Uh, he was pretty highly rated out of New York, four star guy. Uh, another guy that's kind of, you know, signed a couple years ago is kind of. You know, it's been buried on the depth chart, but Martin Aiken out of Bamberg, and obviously Bamberg's produced a few good defensive ends the last couple of years, or uh, recently. So, you know, it'll be interesting to track to see uh, who can sort of make a name for themselves, and that could maybe affect the other 11 games in the regular season. You know, uh, on that other side there with Vic Beasley and Shaq Lawson, I'd like to see uh, a depth chart of a team that has two better defensive ends uh, on one side of the ball uh, that, that's better than those two. Yeah, and they, they bring such different elements to the game, too. You know, Lawson's a bigger guy. He's you know, 6'3", 270. He's going to be a, a guy that's just going to pound on a, a, you know, a tackle during the game. And then you've got Beasley, who's – it's sort of unassuming, but he's so strong, even at, but he's fast. And he's probably, he's going to be around 6'2", around 240, probably a little bit under that playing during the season. But he can speed rush you, but he can attack tackles and just, just wreak havoc. And I think that's what they're expecting him from this year, where he's going to have the attention. He's going to get double teams. But do you want to double team him when you've got Crawford on the other side? When you've got Brady Jarrett coming up the middle, you've got Deshaun Williams, DJ Reader. Yeah, you know, it's it's going to be tough to pick your poison when you're when you're an offensive coordinator because uh, they're going to be all over the place. Moving to the inside, uh, Grady Jarrett, Carlos Watkins uh, at the nose tackle, uh, Watson. William, Watson Williams, uh, Deshaun Williams, 
and reader at the other uh, inside position. Uh, pretty deep, pretty talented at those two positions. Yeah, it's it's just like the ends, uh, just the depth. That, well, they have more depth on the interior, and they've got experience to go with that depth. And you know, you've got Jarrett, who's who's played you know the last three years. You've got Josh Watson, Deshaun Williams, and you know, DJ Reader maybe coming into his best season. Uh, he's you know he hasn't been split in time with baseball, but you know this is his second sort of full season where he's you know football is his whole focus. And uh, he's going to be a guy that maybe can vault into the sort of early NFL talk if he has that kind of year. Um, and then you've got behind them, it's even more stacked. You've got a four-star guy in Pagano, and you know, they're going to have – they're going to be able to cycle him out. And Carlos Watkins, he was the guy that started against Georgia and, you know, had the car accident that, that held him out and – and he's getting back into form, and you know his goal is to be starting Georgia again. So, yeah, it's talent, depth, experience. Uh, you know, it's the whole defensive line unit. It'd be very surprising if they're not in the top of tackles for loss again. If they're not even more improved than, the, than they were in sacks last year. Yeah, Grady Jarrett is a is a guy I remember from his freshman season. Uh, who was criticized a lot. Uh, not sure if it was warranted or not, but he's certainly a guy who has grown uh, over the last couple of seasons, and, and maybe it's Dan Brooks, uh, maybe it's just his natural maturation process. But uh, when you were talking about Dick Beasley wreaking habit, Jarrett wreaks habit in his own way. He's not necessarily making a ton of tackles, but he's occupying – uh, those linemen, and he, he makes some spectacular plays and tackles at times, but he's occupying those linemen to allow the other guys to make the tackles. Yeah, it, it's really sad that he doesn't get more recognition just because his stats are a little bit lower, but if you're watching the game, you notice where number 50 is. You you know that opposing offense knows where he is, and uh, you know, it's, he's a guy that he should get plenty of recognition this year because he's going to have a monster season. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, a fierce competitor on the inside where, as you mentioned, there's not a lot of recognition until until something big happens. Uh, but he plays play in and play out. I think it was last year in the Georgia game where he got hurt early. Uh he looked severely injured, and I thought, man, what are we going to do without Grady Jarrett? And looked up the next series, and there he is, uh, wreaking havoc again for the rest of the game. So uh, he's a guy I really enjoy watching on the inside. Moving over to linebacker, uh, T.J. Burrell was listed uh, coming out of spring. It was Burrell or Blanks or Wiggins or Daniel behind him, and I'm assuming – um, at that position, it depends on the formation uh, and the tendencies of the offense, meaning Morrell or Blanks uh, or Wiggins. Uh, Blanks and Wiggins in pass coverage situations is what, I, what I'm assuming. Yeah, I mean, you're losing a four-year starter and a strong set linebacker in Quan and Christian. He's a guy that had his ups and downs, but I mean, he had he had his moments, and he had a monster game against Georgia Tech last year. You know, stopping the option. Uh, there's more experience with your nickelback guys. You got Travis Blanks. They was Corn Wiggins, who played some last year. Uh, Blanks was really comfortable in that role two years ago. Moved to safety, and ne- never seemed to fully have it. And then he tore his ACL, so he'll be back for uh, you know full go for fall camp. Another guy that could be in that nickelback. Uh, is Martin Jenkins. That's given that, you know, they're fine at cornerback with some of the youth that they have there. But uh, I mean, he could be there. You know, the strong side linebacker situation, it's all an experience. You got T.J. Burrell, he played 80 snaps. It was very quiet 80 snaps. Uh, there wasn't, you know, nothing real, nothing you could really stand out. And then you've got Dorian Daniel coming off the red shirt, uh, and they said 
uh, Venable said uh, last week that you know, they kind of had to bring him along because he played mostly offense in high school. But, I mean, they think that his ceiling's pretty high. So I don't know how much he's going to, you know, go right off the bat. Uh, you know, it, it makes you wonder with the experience that you have at Nickelback, Nickelback if they're going to be playing maybe more 4 2 five, more uh, 3 three five, you know, this year than, you know, straight 3 4 4 3. Yeah, interesting. Uh, just on a side note here, uh, looking at your previews you did of all of the games on orangeandwhite.com, uh, there was a lot of four two five defenses. It seems to be in vogue these days. Uh, yeah, a lot, a lot of teams that are moving to it just this season. I think Georgia Tech and uh, NC State are both there, and then you got UNC does it, and yeah, South Carolina's been running four two five for a while now. But yeah, you've got a lot of teams going to that just because it, it makes sense to have another defensive back on the field when you're facing some of these spread offenses. Absolutely. Well, we've got Stefan Anthony in the middle, um, uh, backed up by Goodson. Um, don't know how good Goodson is, but I know Anthony's really good in the middle. Yeah, I mean, you can't ask for a, a better quarterback of your defense right there. He's got the talent. Uh, you know, he's a pretty vocal leader, and, uh, you know, he, he makes plays. Uh, he's going to be, I think he's in the top ten in the nation uh, among returners and tackles for loss. So, you know, he makes plays. He uh, gets in the backfield. and he, He's, he's uh, been pretty good in coverage uh, in some key spots. I know he had a, a key interception in the Orange Bowl. So, you know, he, defenses have to, or offenses have to know where he is on the field. And at the other linebacker position, you know, this is one we've joked about, but this is the other internet sensation here. Uh, Tony Stewart, uh, the much remembered, often requested, why the heck isn't he on the field? Uh, it's almost like uh, a Sasquatch sighting or the Loch Ness Monster or something, but it looks like Tony Stewart, the fans are finally going to get their wish, and Stewart is going to be a starter. He's been tough. It's just been a really strange case because he had the knee injury out of high school. He didn't know how much you were going to play him, and but he did end up playing right away. And then he had another knee injury, and so he's had injuries, serious knee injuries in both knees. And now he's coming off his first fully healthy season as a senior, as a projected starter at week five, uh, taking over for Spencer Shuey. Uh, you know, he was solid in reserve role last year. Uh, he had to tackle every 5.8 snaps, which is pretty decent. Uh, he, he won a special teams award for having eight tackles on special teams. And he's, uh, he's definitely a mystery in terms of expectations as a full-time guy because we just haven't seen him out there. But I think what helps him maybe helps and hurts him is, is that he's going to be pushed. Uh, I don't think there's going to be pressure for him to be Spencer Shuey just because I think Ben Bowler is that good that he's going to be able to be on the field with you know in his place sometimes, maybe pushing him for that starting role. So I think that's going to make both of them better. And, uh, you know, Bowler's a guy that Dad loves. I mean, Venable loves. Everybody loves I think Davo called him the ultimate football player last year. So yeah, that's a, a pretty good uh, moniker to have. Yeah, I was, I was, that was one of my questions that I was going to going to raise um, with Stewart's injury history. How much will Bullwear? How much action will Bullwear see? Uh, because between the two of them, there's not a whole lot of on the field experience. Uh, obviously, Stewart's been around for this fourth year. But actual playing time, um, neither one of them have seen much time other than, than special teams. So um, perhaps they'll share the position somewhat. Though I know the Tony Stewart crowd is going to hate that I hate that I say that because they've been waiting four years for this guy uh, to get on the field. Uh, I, I think we'll see. I think we'll see plenty of Stewart. Uh, it's just a matter. Of, I don't think he's going to play. 
maybe quite as many snaps as Shuey did. That, and that makes sense with this with this history. On to the defensive backs, and this is a position uh, that scares me a little bit, not because I don't believe there's talent there, but another position where there are eight guys listed, um, three of the eight have zero snaps, and another one has 21 snaps. Uh, so that's four out of the eight combined have uh, 21 snaps. Um, uh, you have a freshman with zero snaps at one corner. The other corner has 21 snaps. You've got uh, T.J. Green, who moved over from wide receiver, which does a backup safety, who has obviously zero snaps at that position. And to top all that off, our last suspension of the season, hopefully, Gary Peters listed as a backup to Alexander, who has zero snaps, is out for the Georgia game with a suspension. It looks suspiciously thin to me at this point. Yeah, it's just like the other line. It's uh, it's not ideal, but to go into you know that kind of environment with uh, two underclassmen projected starters, very shaky depth. Uh, yeah, it's it's gonna be tough. Uh, it's an interesting depth chart because yeah, Mackenzie Alexander's listed as a starter, the five star guy. He had the injury that happened before fall camp that kind of kept him out and forced him to redshirt. Uh, he's listed as a starter, and Venable said recently that he didn't feel like he was game-ready by the end of the spring, but he thinks he's going to be there. And so you're acting on kind of – you're projecting out. That's what Clemson's doing right now. They think he's going to be that guy. Um it was Tankersley, a Cordelia Tankersley, uh, true sophomore, uh, went to prep school route and played a little bit last year, played most of special, special teams, a lot like uh, Tony Stewart, made the most of it. And I think Venable said that he basically shared improvement that he basically didn't see anywhere else, that he made such a leap in this you know, year or so that he's been on campus or well, a year and a half. He was early in the league last year. So I think they have high expectations for him. And then, you know, it's just going to be building depth from there. Uh, you know, the, the first game, uh, you're going to have a, probably a freshman backing up a freshman at, behind Alexander, either Marcus Edmonds or uh, Adrian Baker. Uh, you know, one of those guys has to play. Interesting. Yeah, one of the most interesting things on this depth chart to me, I guess, is the most experienced guy, Mark Jenkins, is listed as backup. Um, uh, while you know, and it doesn't mean that these are spring depth charts, and they certainly could change, uh, you know, moving forward. But it's just, I just found that interesting with the lack of experience um, at really all four positions, though Carson and Johnson. Uh, have some experience. Um, just in general, a lack of experience. You've got the most experienced listed as a backup. Uh, the biggest contributor, I would say, to this to this point in his career. Uh, moving on to the specialist. Um, okay, we have Cole Stout, who has big shoes to fill, replacing Taj Boyd. We have Adam Humphreys, who has to replace... Uh, one of the greatest players in Clemson history, and Sammy Watkins. And four years ago or so after the Auburn game uh, in Auburn, I thought I would never in my life did I imagine saying this, but Ammon Lincoln has huge shoes to fill in the place-kicking uh, role. What Have we seen anything from him that leads us to believe he can uh, perhaps not the cap man right off the bat, but at least go into that role. I think what you like is that he's not a freshman. He's been on campus. He's learned under Catanzaro. And Catanzaro really developed in his four years. I mean, he was better each season. He had the red shirt year, uh, came in and was just, you know, under fire, having to make those kicks at Auburn and, he made a lot of big kicks over his, you know, four years. 
uh, you know, Lake was a guy that's highly rated. Uh, he actually comes from the same school as uh, Mark Buckles and Charlie Whitehurst. And, uh, you know, he's, he seems pretty cool under pressure, but we haven't seen him in those many pressure situations. So, you know, they only kicked 14 field goals last year, which is kind of strange. Uh, scored more touchdowns. Uh, I think that's something that Morris would take. But you may be in a few more close games this year where you need that three points. So it, it's it's a mystery, but uh, I you know it's it's hard to say how he's going to do. Uh, you, I don't think you need him to be Catanzaro, but you need him to be good enough to not lose you games where you're missing, you know, simple kicks. Right, and I think this is a position where uh, I think we learn this from from Catanzaro is that. Um, the way you kick in practice, um, because I remember Davo raving about Catman, uh, his freshman, his redshirt year and his freshman season in practice, uh, but it didn't translate to the games until he uh, matured and grew into uh, the incredible kicker he turned out to be. Uh, it, I went from uh, went from having no faith in that guy kicking the ball to just basically counting three points uh, uh, by the, through his career, uh, you know, went from uh, no confidence to, eh, chalk it up, it's three. Uh, and I, now, I don't recall ever seeing that guy. Perhaps it's David Treadwell, who, who uh, um, if you know your Clemson history, uh, his first field goal attempt, he was a soccer player, his first field goal attempt, I believe was from 36 yards, and it was short. Um, but uh, Virginia Tech was offside, and he got another chance, and he and he made it. And from then on, uh, ended up you know years in the NFL, et cetera. So, uh, I, Cat Catman just grew into a really really good kicker, and and uh, Mr. Wakeup had some big shoes to fill. I think Brad Brad Pinion, Bradley Pinion is a solid punter. He was inconsistent as a freshman, uh, a little bit better last year, and uh, not too concerned at that position. What do you think about uh, Pena? He's, he's just solid. I mean, 24 kicks inside the 20, no touchbacks. Uh, he was, I think, he was the last among um, another regular punters in the ACC in uh, yards per punt, which is interesting. But you know, I think some of that maybe just because you know he was, you know, more short field situations where he was kicking it inside the 20. He wasn't having to kick it all the way downfield. So it'll be interesting to see if that, that number goes up. I'm sure it will. I will also imagine, uh, and I haven't looked at the numbers, I could be totally wrong, but that he didn't get a lot of opportunities, um, not just the long kicks, but just in general. Uh, uh, Clemson scored a lot of touchdowns last year. Uh, so he probably didn't get as many opportunities as some, um, but I I think he's he's a solid solid punter as you said inside the twenties. How many inside the twenty without a touchback? Uh, twenty four. You would be yeah. just just the odds of <laughs> one mowing into the end zone. Interesting. It'll be interesting to see what happens this year in that situation. Uh, we talked briefly uh, about the punt return and the kick returns, and to me. Um, I think the last big kick return I remember was uh, Sammy's freshman year against Maryland. Um, uh, I think this is a kind of a position, at least in my mind, and I could be wrong, that the coaches have just opted for safety and get the ball versus potential for a big play, which, you know, makes sense when you consider the offense that Clemson has uh, put on the field the last three years, you want to make sure that you get the ball, um, and you're not you're not um, uh, searching for that big play on special teams. What do you think about Adam Humphreys as the punt returner and Sharon Peak as the kickoff returner, at least listed on the depth chart that way? I think they definitely take uh, you know a few more big yardage plays from the punt return game, but I think. One of the uh, standards that Davo talked about last year was getting at least 10 yards per punt return. And that's what I think uh, 
Humphreys is right around there. It, his issue, I think, is that he can get some yards here and there, but he just hasn't. He's not really that home run threat that Sammy was. You know, UNC has that in Ryan Switzer. Switzer, I think he had like two punt return touchdowns just in the bowl game. He had five touchdowns, period. You know, you'd obviously love to have that kind of threat. You know, kick return, they haven't had anything in the kick return game much since Watkins either. And, it, you know, even, I mean, since 2011, Watkins. So, you know, I think they may be trying out some new guys. Uh, you know, Peak is left as the starter right now. I'm not sure. I mean, if I'm the coach, I'm not sure I'm risking Peak you know, injury on kick returns. So I'd maybe have, like, our Tavis Scott there. It may be come down to trust issues with a freshman, but I think they're going to try out a few guys. I mean, TJ Green came in last year, and he returned some punts, and he was on kick returns a bunch. So he may even be a guy that could still be out there even moving over to the defensive side. You know, you make an excellent point about Peak with coming off the injury. I, I didn't even think of that angle, uh, but that, that's got to be a concern because um, if he goes down, um, that leaves Priester and Hopper at that five position, uh, well, at least on the depth that chart wise. So, yeah, that has to be a, uh, a concern moving forward. All right, Brandon, I appreciate your time. Anything else uh, in general that you wanted to talk about before we wrap this one up? Well, we didn't really touch on the safeties. Uh, you know, it's it, they've. I think Venables, both Venables and Reed have kind of said that, uh, you know, Jaron Curse and Jadar Johnson are sort of one and one A there. It'll be interesting to see if uh, Jadar can beat Curse out because Curse seems like kind of such a, a freak talent that, you know, he can get around the field and kind of, you know, track down balls. And and then you got Robert Smith, who's, who's really seems like an anchor for that secondary. He's really grown there, and behind him is T.J. Green moving over to that position. It seems like uh, Venables is very high on Green's ceiling and that he can really be a, a solid guy there, maybe not this year, but you know, going forward. Yeah, I would. I, I, I liked what I saw at Curse last year. Obviously, a young player um, made some mistakes, uh, but um, in general... Right, right to what I saw there. Uh, it is interesting that I did read, uh, once again, everything on the Internet is true, uh, <laughs> that J.R. Johnson uh, had a chance to beat, it, beat Curse out or at least start. Uh, uh, so it is interesting. And, and Robert Smith is, like you said, from my perspective, he's grown over over the last three years. Um uh, I don't know what to expect from T.J. Green uh, behind him or how much he'll play. So that will be interesting. We will, uh, in the next uh, week or so, we'll talk about the schedule. We'll, uh, ben and I will walk through all 12 games. Yes, we are going to talk about South Carolina State and Georgia State. Uh, uh, so be sure to tune in for those episodes. Uh, that that'll wrap up this episode. Uh, thank you.